and I'm with the Iowa Department of Public Health. Welcome to the fifth of six webinars on pediatric brain injury. Today we will be hearing from Natasha Ress, who is the Director of Programs and Services and Neuro Resource Facilitation Coordinator with the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa, as well as Jeff Lauer, who is the Executive Director of the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa. They're going to be talking about partnering together after brain injury. So I am going to turn things over to Natasha. All right, can you see my screen? Yep, we sure can. All right, super. All right, well thanks everyone for joining us today. We do appreciate the fact that you are uh, live here on our webinar. And if, for those of you who are listening archived, uh, if you have any questions, we are, of course, uh, here to answer. And so please feel free for both those live and, and recorded folks that are listening to give us a call. Our, um, the Brain Injury Alliance, a little bit of a, a background of the Brain Injury Alliance, is that we are an advocacy organization that helps people uh, deal with brain injury after, after their brain injuries, uh, we, our mission is that we help prevent, educate, advocate, research, and support uh, those who have uh, uh, gone through the brain injury journey. Um, that can be from a, a survivor themselves to a family member, professional, other interested party in the community, friends, loved ones, etc. Our service is free to those who call. Uh, we work statewide. So, uh, and we'll get into a little bit about what our services pertain to. But please, if you have further questions, if you feel like you uh, are, are looking to receive more information, we would be more than happy to uh, go ahead and uh, send that out to you or, or talk to you over the phone, come into our office, write us, email us, et cetera. So I'm going to get started today on, uh, on what we're talking about, partnering together after brain injury. And I'm going to have to figure out my slides here. All right, I, I've advanced. Uh, I'm hoping everyone can see the uh, first slide here. Learning objectives. The learning objectives that we have for today's webinar are a few basics. I, I personally feel that it's very important for us to understand the root of brain injury, the education behind brain injury, and that therefore we can go forth and get into the nitty gritty of the brain injury, the, the uh, challenges and how to how to provide interventions, et cetera. But it's really important for us to understand the basics. So acquired versus traumatic brain injury is going to be a, a section that we're going to be looking at. We will also look at brain behavior, uh, so some basics uh, as to the lobes of the brain and what they control. We're also going to be looking at a, a large service from the Brain Injury Alliance entitled Neuro Research Facilitation and how it can help you as well as our last bullet there is advocacy efforts to increase support. So moving right along, awareness. We're going to talk a little bit about awareness. And of course, in our society these days, there's so many plights that we want others to be aware of. Uh, if you Google awareness, clip art, you'll find a multitude of ribbons, awareness weeks, months, walks, etc. cetera. Uh, I found, uh, when I Googled uh, awareness, I found out uh, when uh, Vegetarian Awareness Week was. I found out when Left-Handed People's Awareness Day was, all sorts of different things people want uh, to educate and inform others about. But then I found this photo, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> and this photo popped up to me and it grabbed my attention. So in the, in the photo you'll see some birds with the caption below reading, blue-footed boobies. And the birds have a breast cancer awareness ribbon pinned to their, to their uh, fronts there. Now, when I give talks or trainings to groups, I ask people, you know, when is Breast Cancer Awareness Month? And at least 75% of people will shout out, you know, October, we know that. Um, then I ask what color their breast cancer awareness typically will be, and, and they shout out pink. Everyone, everyone knows that. It's pretty associated. You'll go to the store and see uh, items with pink ribbons on them. Uh, there's a lot of marketing for, for what Breast Cancer Awareness uh, Month is, uh, walks, runs, et cetera. But then I ask when Brain Injury Awareness Month is, and I get a lot of blank stares. Uh, I get very few people to raise their hand or guess, and uh, I get even less when I ask what color you know, signifies brain injury awareness. The interesting thing behind that, the reason why I want to call this out, is that 
there are more people who are significantly affected by brain injury than there are by breast cancer. However, the Susan G. Komen Foundation has done an excellent job of raising awareness and educating people as to why it's important to know about breast cancer. So kind of back to the picture here, uh, I thought it was a catchy picture, and I couldn't possibly uh, think it was real. I thought blue-footed boobies and, and breast cancer, that's, that's cutesy. Um, but I did Google it. I said, well, you know, is there such a thing? And I found out that there is actually a bird called the blue-footed blue booby. Uh, the blue-footed booby, a little bit about that uh, bird, is that they're found in the Pacific Rim. They have blue feet, um, and they actually raise their feet to mate. Uh, the, the bluer or more vibrant the, the foot, the more um, uh, thought the, the uh, blue-footed booby is. And they have this interesting mating dance where they raise their feet, and, and that's uh, actually uh, something that will call to their, uh, to their uh, mates. So after studying them for long peri periods of time, scientists became aware that their feet served a purpose, and it was that awareness that helped us understand what their purpose was. Um, so someone tagged them again in the breast cancer awareness cartoon here, and because it, it, it captures our attention, it creates our awareness. Um, that, again, is uh, the reason why we're coming to you today is that we want to capture your attention, create some awareness about brain injury, um, you know, and, and make sure that you're educated and that you're able to spread some education to others in, in, your, in your community about brain injury, um, making sure that we are all on the same page uh, as, as one another and, and making sure we're creating people who can go out there and, uh, and really educate others. So now hopefully that I have your attention. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, awareness of brain injury. Why do we want to become aware of brain injury? Well, we want to increase your sensitivity to brain injury. Brain injury has often been seen as the hidden disability. Um, many a times, people who have physical disabilities, when we, when we focus and see them, we see, you know, oh, wow, this person may need a ramp if they're in a wheelchair, or this person may um, need some assistance uh, if they've got broken their arm or, or whatnot. Um, it's very easy for us to, to identify physical disabilities. And if someone has a cognitive or a, what we call kind of a thinking disability, uh, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to capture that. And so a person can be walking down the street and you would not realize that that person had or has not had a brain injury, um, which makes it difficult for us sometimes, you know, to be aware and, and sensitive to, you know, the needs of that person. So we'd like to raise awareness if, if those symptoms come out of brain injury that, okay, wow, you know, I understand a little bit more about this. Um, I can provide accommodations within certain interventions, um, you know, and, and, and along with that, you know, the standard interventions sometimes are not going to work for, uh, for kiddos with brain injury. So uh, we also have to make sure we're aware and, uh, and educate others that, you know, same intervention might not work for the, for the same kid, for kiddos with different disabilities. Uh, specifically for brain injury. And of course, we want to allow for proactive referrals for support and advocacy. I think it's very important if we take uh, away a, a theme from this uh, talk is that being proactive is much better for a child uh, with many different types of disabilities, but especially brain injury, than being reactive. Um, putting something into place spur of the moment is very difficult for someone with a brain injury. So being proactive, informing that child, and making sure that we are um, walking through the steps of the referrals and supports for them is very important. So being proactive is, is a key here. We're going to go through a couple definitions. These are very simple definitions that I'd like to go through, but I think very important as well. Um, I'm going to start off, in fact, with a, a different definition than what, than what is on your screen here. Um, about 30 years ago or so, the Brain Injury Alliance was once called the Head Injury Foundation, the Iowa Head Injury Foundation. And it was called that because when we um, were able to start saving lives after the 1970s or so, medical technology came about and a lot more people were living through brain injury. And they were being kind of called having a head injury. They, that was kind of the, the standard line was that they had a head injury. So anything basically above the neck was, was uh, considered a head injury, and it really didn't tell us a lot about what the person specifically had. Um, a head injury right now we know is when someone breaks their nose or if it's a laceration across the cheek. A brain injury, however, is when a person has 
dealt with some cognitive deficits or some changes in cognition due to an injury or insult to the brain. So it's very important that we understand the differences in that. I, I've even heard doctors nowadays still referring to head injury. Head injury does not really describe what we're dealing with. Brain injury is a much better descriptive word, so we like to use that. Um, we actually, uh, I, I was watching the news last summer, and uh, you know, these mainstream places are still using this tech, uh, terminology. Uh, the, the news had reported that a teenager had um, taken an ATV and hit a tree. And they reported that the, the teenager was, um, had suffered head injuries. And then they did a follow-up story, and we found out that, they had got, that this teenager had gone to a brain injury rehabilitation, uh, one of the larger brain injury rehabilitation spots in the Midwest, and so we knew that that, person, that teenager had suffered a brain injury. So it's very uh, important that we kind of distinguish between the two. Head injury means, you know, a, a, a you know, torn earlobe. Brain injury is something where we are dealing with lifelong um, consequences and, and possibly disability. Acquired brain injuries and traumatic brain injuries, there's, there's a difference between these. A lot of people will think, okay, brain injury, a fall, a motor vehicle crash. Um, things that are traumatic in nature, an insult, an external insult to the brain. And that's typically what we see when we even run statistics and such, is that they are reported in traumatic brain injury results. However, that is not the only type of brain injury there are. We also have acquired brain injury, and acquired brain injury actually encompasses all of the traumatic brain injuries, including, so not just limited to those external uh, blows to the head, but also strokes tumors, uh, something called anoxic injuries or a loss of oxygen, uh, suffocation, near drowning, poisoning, hydrocephalus, etc. So there's a large number of acquired brain injuries out there. And if you look at statistics, there are 3.1 million Americans that are dealing with lifelong um, disabilities due to traumatic brain injury, and there are 6.4 million Americans dealing with lifelong uh, disability due to stroke alone. Stroke is a type of acquired brain injury, so that doesn't even encompass all of the acquired brain injuries, but just those two, stroke and traumatic brain injury, um, you have 10 million people out there that are um, dealing with lifelong uh, consequences due to these things. So we've got a lot of folks that are out there with brain injury, um, that have been struggling after their brain injuries, trying to uh, compensate for those. And so it's very important that we understand that. All right, I'm moving right along. Hopefully everyone's with me on their slides. Uh, the next reason, a child with brain injury, what, what are we seeing here? Well, a child with brain injury may be more difficult to engage. Um, and we'll learn this in the, the next, uh, in the preceding slides here. But I want to call to the fact that um, motor vehicle crashes have historically been our number one reason for traumatic brain injuries in, the, in, the, in Iowa as well as the United States. However, recently falls have overtaken uh, motor vehicle crashes. The interesting thing about falls is that you will typically fall forward. You hear a lot of people hitting their frontal lobe or, or right where their uh, forehead is. And that is a place that um, controls executive functioning. And that executive functioning um, is in control of initiation. It's in control of impulsivity, et cetera. So you may see a child who's more difficult to engage because there's a leading cause right now of falls in Iowa as well as the United States, and uh, that, that part of the brain has been damaged. You may also see a child with brain injury that shows decreased follow through on tasks. Um, that might be due to memory, it might be due to attention, um, poor neural pathways, et cetera. Um, so we have to be cognizant that a, a, a child might not be able to follow through and uh, follow the steps of certain tasks. Um, due to the type of brain injury they've had. A child might not be able to remember prior discussions or routines. So I've heard a lot of folks working with children's brain injury that say, don't you remember? And they fill in the blank after that. And you will be literally hitting, you know, you're, you're you know, slapping your he head going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, I've said this, don't you remember this? Don't you remember that we don't do this? Don't you remember that we do do this? It, it's really important to understand if memory has been uh, impaired that don't you remember signs or, or, or uh, uh, slogans there, maybe not the best thing to say to a, a child with memory issues. 
uh, a child with brain injury might also have some difficulty profiting from the typical interventions provided. Um, they might not profit because they, um, there's, you know, they've already said, even though you've got a child who displays the same behaviors as a child with brain injury, and you're trying to perform the same interventions because you see this outcome of behavior that's coming from this and think, well, you know, we're going to instill this, this intervention that's working for Johnny, it might not work for Bobby due to the, due to the nature of the brain injury. Another slide that has to do with uh, children with brain injury, they might have more difficulty adjusting to large groups and standard rules. I think it's very important that we understand, you know, uh, the standard rules, you know, stand quietly in line might be a little confusing for a child with brain injury. It might work for other children. Uh, they might understand the, the concept of standing in line, being quiet, but that might not be a, a concept that is uh, something that's familiar to a child with brain injury. And also, large groups, you know, we might see increased stimulation um, and, and problems with overstimulation for children. So if you're in a large group where there's commu uh, co confusion or commotion or bright lights or lots of sounds, that can also be difficult for a child to process all those thoughts and flooding information that's coming into that child's uh, uh, brain. We may see greater behavior control issues due to this, and so we're going to be talking a lot about that during this, uh, during this talk. And we may appear, uh, we have children that may appear more confused, more inattentive, and more fatigued than other children and students. And I think that's a, a key right there. Um, we have been working with, with a, a, a doctor from UCLA who has been doing a lot of studies on rest after brain injury, um, specifically concussion. And as we all probably are aware of, there's a lot of different uh, uh, focus on youth sports and concussion these days. Uh, we found that children who are able to rest, both physically, mentally, cognitively, et cetera, are those who will get closer back to baseline after their concussion. Um, those who exert themselves too soon after uh, the brain injury uh, typically do not reach that baseline again. So it's very important that we understand the, the the simplicity of, of um, taking breaks and resting and those sorts of things. This is a great slide here. Uh, this shows us a couple different things. Um, first of all, if you see, I'm hoping everyone can see this slide, it's in color, and you'll see numbers on the bottom and low to high sensitivity on the top. This slide represents when children develop their skills. So if we see here, we're looking at um, vision, which is in white, hearing, which is in uh, uh, green, uh, we see that those types of uh, skills are developed early on. In between, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3-ish or so, we're, we're developing those skills. Whereas other types of skills are developed at later on in life, numbers, peer social skills, uh, language, etc. The reason why we like to show this slide is that depending on when the child was injured, will affect how that skill is developed. And so we have to learn that if the person, if the child that was injured was injured early, we might see different types of development with their vision and hearing. Or if they're um, injured, you know, closer to school time, maybe peer social skills are impacted and affected. Uh, so it's very important to understand that there are different times of social development and, and skill development. And that will be a, a huge impact on you know when the uh, when you're, you're when the child's injured about how they will develop those skills. So now we get to the lobes of the brain. I think it's very important for us to understand some brain injury basics. There are four main lobes that we talk about in the brain. Um, hopefully, everyone can see this is color coded. Um, we talk about the frontal lobe. This is the lobe that is closest to obviously the front of your head. Um, it's by your forehead and, and kind of on the top of your head. It is the lobe that controls a lot of different functionings, a lot of very important functionings, and it, of course, is the lobe that is, you know, um, if we have a motor vehicle crash or a fall, the one that's more than likely to be affected. Um, we have temporal lobes that are in the blue. We've got those on both sides of our brain. We've got the parietal lobe, which is a little further back in yellow. And we have the occipital lobe, which is in green, which is a little bit further back even more so. So we're going to talk a little bit about brain behavior relationships with these lobes. The frontal lobe is, as I was discussing before, in charge of executive functioning. Um, 
we all multitask. Everyone in this world that you know is, is taking care of kids or working or trying to just get through your day is multitasking. You've got several different things usually going on at one time. How do we do that? How do we divide our attention? Well, we do so by executive functioning. Um, it's the steps that we take in order to um, organize and compartmentalize our lives so that we can get through the day. So our frontal lobe is in charge of initiation, so our ability to start tasks, problem solving, um, you know, being able to break down tasks by you know, uh, the steps, judgment, uh, inhibition of behaviors, self-monitoring, so our social editing, things that kind of slip out sometimes, that's that frontal lobe is, is maybe not doing its, its job, organization, attention and concentration, mental flexibility, and, and so on and so on. So it's a very important, uh, they're all important, but you know, an injury to the frontal lobe really affects day-to-day -day people when they're trying to get through day-to-day -day activities. The parietal lobe then also includes sense of touch, space, um, spatial, spatial, spatial perception. So a person who is in a crowded classroom um, might weave uh, or bang into desks or those sorts of things because that spatial perception is not there. Um, we've had adults who um, have damaged their parietal lobe, and um, we're, you know, they were labeled as being drunk or, or um, you know, on the use of drugs because they had um, a wavering to their gait and those sorts of things. That's what is controlling that spatial perception, that's that parietal lobe. The temporal lobe then is involved with your memory, your hearing, understanding your, that language that's coming in, some organizational uh, attributes, and sequencing. So it's very important to, to notice that that temporal lobe is involved with a lot of different things that really are, affect our lives. And the occipital lobe is your vision. Um, some of our clients have double vision after brain injury. Um, it's the processing of those images that that occipital lobe is in, in charge of. So now that we've known, uh, you know, now that we've learned a little bit about that, the what controls what, we're going to look at the variability of brain injury. Now, how people uh, react after their brain injury is due to many different things. Um, one of them could be pre-injury profiles, so the age that they're at, the, the level of education that they've received. Uh, their past behaviors, exercise, diet, those types of things are all very influential as to your pre-injury profile and how you do after brain injury. As well as your location of the brain injury, we notice that uh, different lobes control different uh, functions that you use every day. The severity of your brain injury, so we notice that you know a person can have a moderate, a mild, a severe brain injury, and that's going to affect the type of recovery you have the medical or rehabilitation care that you get, so um, how soon it happens, how long it goes for, how good the care is, what types of approaches and, and uh, methodologies they're using, and post-injury family support. Uh, when I look at this, uh, I, I look at a couple different people that have been called out into the limelight lately. Uh, one in particular, or actually two, are Gabrielle Gifford and Bob Woodruff. Um, these are two people who received excellent uh, timely medical rehabilitation care afterwards. Uh, we see Gabby Gifford with her husband by her side, who's very supportive. Um, you know, the, the, they both received pretty devastating brain injuries, but have yet come out um, doing pretty well, actually. And it was due to a lot of these variables being met. So when we look at symptoms, we look at three main types of symptoms. Um, physical symptoms cognitive symptoms and emotional symptoms. And I've got two slides on this, so you'll have to, uh, I apologize right now, we're going to be flipping uh, kind of back and forth after we go through this here. But the physical symptoms that you might see are speech symptoms. Somet sometimes people have uh, slurred speech. Um, they uh, might not be able to form words, etc. cetera. Uh, they might have some vision issues, hearing issues. Headaches are a really common thing after brain injury due to the type of jolts that the brain has incurred, as well as the swelling and different um, neurotransmitters uh, that have been affected. Motor coordination, spasticity of muscles. If you've um, ever talked to someone who might be a little spastic um, after brain injury due to, due to the, the brain not being able to send those uh, uh, coordination efforts down to the muscles. Um, so some people are on different types of uh, medications to help with that, such as baclofen or Botox, et cetera. Um, so you might see that after brain injury. 
but not always. Not You won't always have a person who's got physical effects from their brain injury. So a lot of the time, people will have some cognitive and emotional effects. Um, STM stands for short-term memory. So cognitively, someone might be able to remember the address that they live at or what their mother's name is, but they might not be able to remember things like what they had for breakfast that morning or um, you know, uh, what, uh, what, 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 um, what therapy they just came from. Uh, some people will have some impaired concentration, some slower thinking, attention issues, uh, perceptions. They might be, uh, have misperceptions or misunderstanding of perceptions or communication skills. And, and when we talk about communication skills, we, we think about um, things that might be labeled quote unquote inappropriate um, and social uh, editing skills there. Emotional uh, symptoms that we might see are mood swings or emotional liability, uh, denial uh, or grief that's going on. Uh, we see some people who are self-centered. Sometimes uh, folks have a difficult time understanding the world around them. They're still trying to grasp their own uh, sense of identity, and they're unable to really see how that affects others. They've got some anxiety and depression. Those are two very, very large. Um, when we hear of folks who have brain injury afterwards, we hear a lot about anxiety and depression. A lot of that is situational. Um, the person may not have had that prior to the brain injury. However, they're labeled as having some mental health issues due to anxiety or depression. I think it's very important for us to understand some of these, you know, not always, but a majority of the time, this is situational um, inspired. And these, these are things that are able to um, become better. Uh, depending on the situation of the person after their brain injury and how much how much support they can receive. And sometimes there's some lower, lowered self-esteem. We're going to keep going here with physical needs. Um, there's some paralysis, seizures sometimes happen after brain injury due to swelling, et cetera. Um, balance issues, fatigue is huge, just like we talked about. Cognitively, we might see some issues with planning or writing reading. Um, those are huge in, in school, especially when we're trying to develop those skills. Um, judgment issues cognitively might be affected. Uh, emotionally, um, I think it's very important that we understand that when a person's injured, again, that developmental stage is sometimes there's a, there's a kind of a, a loop back to it. Sometimes we're stunted in that stage. So such a, a person who might be um, injured at 15, who might think that fart jokes are hilarious, and their 15-year-old friends are thinking that that's an absolute, you know, funniest thing they've ever heard is a fart joke. When they're 35, they might still be telling those fart jokes, and it's just not the same. And they can't understand that, but they're, they're kind of stunted sometimes emotionally and, and uh, in that developmental phase of a 15-year-old with that kind of humor, as well as sexual dysfunction. And I think it's very important that we discover that sexual dysfunction, um, sexuality has its place after brain injury, just along with you know, any other emotion. Um, you're sometimes you know, experiencing kids who are going through puberty or um, developing those you know, feelings. And to, um, to not describe and talk to that person about that is really doing an injustice to, to the child. Uh, we have actually consulted with uh, a wonderful doctor, Dr. Tina Trudell out of Wisconsin, who does a wonderful uh, speech and training on sexuality and brain injury, after brain injury. And it's very important for us to understand, you know, even though it's not comfortable or we might want to um, keep that vulnerable uh, person uh, secure and, and, and safe, that there's a, there's a side there that needs to be talked about. And, and sometimes we'll see uh, a, you know, 35-year-old man who was injured at 15 who's got a 22-year-old um, caregiver, a, a woman, um, where they might reach out and touch their boob or their, uh, their behind. Uh, and, and realistically, um, you know, that, that flusters the provider sometimes. We've gotten calls, well, gosh, you know, she's just not comfortable. She feels sexually harassed. You know, why is he, um, you know, displaying this type of behavior? It's because that's the type of learning they, that a person after brain injury has. There's boundary issues that we have to learn from. And that person is not necessarily receive, you know, meaning to go out and offend, but they're, again, trying to learn what boundaries they have. And so for us to try to hide it under a rug is, is doing them a, a, a disjustice. Uh, there's emotional restlessness. There's lack of motivation. Uh, there's difficulty containing their emotions. So it's very important that we understand there's different symptoms that go along with brain injury that we can sometimes identify 
and we can you know, start to understand the possible behavioral social effects. Now, now that we've seen the symptoms, we want to look at kind of their effects on how they, people have behaviors and social interactions. So you might see a, ch a child who's irritable um, due to some of these cognitive and emotional effects. Uh, you might see a child who's impulsive or at higher risk behavior. Uh, we do know that, <clears throat> that a person who's had one brain injury is three times more likely to have a second and eight times more likely to have a third. And we have gotten calls from people who've had multiple injuries. We also know the effects of concussion can uh, really be uh, detrimental the more concussions you have. Um, so it's very important that we understand there's some high-risk behavior sometimes associated with brain injury. Um, there's sometimes a, a, a lack of insight. Uh, there's denial of deficits. Um, you know, this, this, you know, I don't have a problem. Uh, you know, and, and, and so forth. There's some peer conflicts or um, frustration tolerance issues, and uh, sometimes there's just, you know, a lot of different emotional liability, um, meaning, you know, some, at one point the person's laughing and having a good time, and all of a sudden just a switch goes and, and they're depressed and crying. That's, that's a technical term, uh, one that, you know, a, a lot of folks don't understand and they can't figure out what's going on. So it's important to understand those. Um, Moving right along, we look at our interactions, and some of the following uh, are seen here, um, the challenging behaviors. We might see noncompliance from people. I, I don't know if I, I'm on the fence about that word, actually. Um, but we might see uh, a, a children are, and people are often labeled noncompliant when they don't comply with our standard set of rules. Uh, so I'm not sure if I love that word, but, but for our time being, you know, we'll use that uh, word. Um, and you know you might see aggression, those sorts of things, because of the irritability and frustration tolerance. You you see these types of things: noncompliance, aggression, um, you know, lack of initiation. Those sorts of things uh, will come through, and we say to ourselves, "Why are they acting like this? What's going on?" You know, we we sometimes tend to almost blame the behavior, and it's very important that we understand that those challenging behaviors are due to sometimes the, the brain injury behind them. And so to understand the brain injury might help um, circumvent some of these behaviors. So when you have someone with these behavioral concerns, you may see um, disorders in your family relationships. This puts a lot of stress on families. Uh, you might have extra therapy appointments that families have to fit in around a working schedule. Uh, you might have behavioral upsets that, uh, you know, uh, the, the child in, in uh, daycare or school all day long and then has meltdowns because of fatigue issues uh, at night, which just, you know, leads to upset all around. Um, you might have some grief or guilt of a parent. We've had uh, parents call in and, and discuss that with us as well. Um, so it, it, it definitely places a lot of, um, I don't want to say dysfunction, but sometimes dysfunction in the family. I'll just say that, uh, where, again, situationally um, it can be worked through, but it places a lot of stress on that. We also see changes in peer relationships. Uh, uh, we have a wonderful speaker at our conferences who discusses um, life after brain injury and how many relationships you have uh, prior to the brain injury and then how many you have after. We hear a lot of people saying they had a lot of friends. He was you know, a high school quarterback. He was prom king. And three to four months go by after the brain injury, and no one's around. There's no friends left. Uh, no one comes to see him. Uh, those sorts of things. And, and so it's very difficult for, for children who are still in that, um, that need that peer relationship to, uh, you know, have those changes and, and feel alone and isolated. Uh, you've got some frustrated teachers. I, I do, I've talked to teachers before who have just said, I just don't know what else to do. And um, it's because of these behavioral issues. There's, you know, um, it's, it's difficult teaching a room, a classroom, I'm sure, full of kids and then having a child who's acting out and in a way that is confusing because we don't fully understand their brain injury. We have a loss of trust or independence sometimes. Uh, sometimes you uh, uh, have a person who's now dependent on you for things that they were not before. Maybe you have a 16, 17-year-old who used to drive who now has to receive rides from their parents everywhere. Um, and that can go on up in age. And so, so you're dealing with the loss of a lot of depend independence. And then, of course, there's increased risk for academic failure, substance abuse, sexual behaviors, uh, high-risk behaviors, delinquency, and further traumatic brain injuries or other brain injuries. So um, we, we do look at some other factors that may affect someone with a brain injury. Uh, there can be an exacerbation of pre-injury reactions and or challenges. 
Medication will affect brain injury. Uh, we've, we've talked to a lot of people who have been put on different medications that, that have a, a strong effect on the type of brain injury that they've had, and we've um, had to, you know, they've worked with their psychiatrist or, or, or their doctor on those. There may be seizure activities that, that again, will affect you. Um, sometimes there's an even further loss of cognition after those because it does take such a large amount of energy. So there's a lot of things that will affect factors uh, of brain injury. And again, the behavior factors you can look at also for children, including things like environment, the environmental class size that you have, uh, the consistency of staff. I've always said that um, if there's no consistency for children, you know, in, in particular brain injury, um, it's very difficult. If you're doing something uh, 40 hours a week at school that isn't being followed at home or vice versa, um, it's confusing to the child. It will not uh, result in any sort of uh, uh, success. Um, you really have to have everyone using the same approach and, and doing uh, things the same way 24 hours a day. So it's a very difficult thing to do. Consistency of staff um, may be uh, an environmental uh, issue. Um, I've, had, I've worked with people who get along really well with one person, and the person who comes on their shift afterwards or the, the substitute teacher just they don't get along with. Uh, it's, a, it's a personality issue. That can you know, uh, stifle things. Uh, you've got some communication styles. Um, so how we approach a person with a brain injury depends on the type and uh, location of the brain injury. So we want to make sure that we understand fully that type of injury that they've received. Uh, if we can go back and, and talk to teachers, go through IEP meetings, uh, talk to school psychologists, et cetera, um, understanding that brain injury as, as best possible and understanding what approaches best are used with that type of brain injury are, are key. And you know, it also involves you know, doing this with respect. Um, that's a very big uh, issue as well, is, is we want to treat uh, these children with respect as well. We don't want to talk down to anyone. We want to make sure that they are feeling like they receive that respect. Task demands, again, are going to be factors that affect brain injury. You might have different expectations. Um, the rate of presentation of, of information may be difficult. The rate of success or memory demands might be uh, uh, an issue. Stimulation, again, like we, I discussed before, um, you might have a child who needs to um, you know, wear protective uh, gear around his ears because there's so much stimulation. We've also had children who've had to wear sunglasses or some type of blocking um, because the light is too stimulating and they just cannot learn that way. And so it's very interesting about these factors that can be affecting you. So again, I come back to the variability. Um, you look at that pre-injury profile, the location, the severity, the type of medical care, and your, and your support. Those are very important for us to understand. So um, moving right along here, we're going to talk about a little bit of the basic effective strategies to address behaviors. These are just some easy strategies that you can um, put into effect um, speaking calmly. Uh, once you are uh, become upset, and sometimes that becomes a power struggle. I actually worked with someone uh, who I was trying to, he was a younger gentleman, and trying to, uh, trying to explain to him why it was important for him to get on the bus to go to school. Uh, and, uh, and it was not a calm, uh, you know, I, I was early in the career. I, I did not know uh, power struggles, and I, I could not keep my calm. Uh, when talking with him, and it uh, just became a power struggle where I was not getting anywhere, and this, he was still not getting on the bus, basically. So to remain as calm as possible is, is key, because your upset will then um, go on to someone else. Uh, can you keep your instructions short and simple. Uh, I, I use the um, task analysis that there's, I believe, 45 steps to brushing your teeth. Um, making sure that we keep these steps short and simple and making sure that they're understood is key. Um, maybe we don't flood someone with so much information. Uh, you know, taking it one or two steps at a time. Make sure that you have some predictability in scheduling. It's uh, important not to just drop something or be reactive on, onto a, a child after brain injury. Um, sometimes children need to process. They need more time to process those thoughts. Um, you know, maybe to you, it seems like a great idea just to decide, I'm not going to cook tonight. We're all going to go out for dinner. But that actually is sometimes very, very difficult for a child to switch gears, and that mental flexibility is not there. Um, allow for your rest breaks. Provide low stimulation. And develop just some simple, positive, basic rules. I think that's very important. Um, I actually take a, an example uh, the, of something that I've been working with uh, recently with child, a child. Um, you know, uh, at, there was a, um, a teacher who decided that the child, 
that they were working with uh, was not acting well to, to that teacher's um, demise. And she was going to instill a smiley face, frowny face sticker every day to the child and said that that's going to be the, the reinforcer. Is, is on the days that they were good, they were going to get a smiley face. And on the days they're bad, they're going to get a frowny face. And so that I had to call out as not being the best method. Um, the smiley face, great. Um, you know, keep, the, keep that positive. The frowny face is just going to make them not want to go to school. If they're going to, you know, associate that, if people have a very difficult time, especially with people with memory issues, have a very difficult time recalling why they uh, received the frowny face, especially a child who's still developing um, that type of cause and effect. Uh, to send someone home with a frowny face is just, there's evidence-based practice saying, this is not, negative reinforcers like that are not going to work as well as positive reinforcers. So just to keep that in mind, keep those ba positive basic rules going. Now, the next slide you see here are, um, this might be for a younger child, but I want to call it out. I think it's a great slide. Um, there are different types of learning. Some children will have better verbal uh, learning, and some child, children will have better visual learning. Uh, I'm a person who's a visual learner, so some charts like these would be very helpful to me to be actually physically see what we're asking the person to do. Um, you know, again, understanding the brain injury, the type of brain injury they received, and the type of learning, the, the, the best way that they can learn. And then putting those uh, into effect are very, very uh, good strategies and skills to have. So I, uh, I have to be here, uh, humble here, and say that this is not my example. But our advisory council on brain injury uh, developed uh, a flip book for schools. And I believe it's either out right now or coming out shortly. And this flip book is available to teachers, principals, counselors, uh, school psychologists, et cetera, anyone who's um, working with a person with a brain injury. And they had a really great um, section of their flip book here that states specifically define the behavior of, con of concern so that you can quantify the behavior. Now, this involves looking at what you want to study, what you want to uh, decrease as a negative, uh, maybe a negative challenging behavior, and actually taking the time you would have to do some charting and those sorts of things. Um, now, if you want to hear more about those, that type of uh, uh, positive behavioral approach, we can you know, definitely talk to you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But um, the, the example that they use here, the weak example, is the student is being defiant and refusing to comply with instructions. Well, what does that mean? I really don't know what that means from that sentence. How are they being defiant? Um, what are they doing to refuse to comply with instructions? Why are the instructions so important? Uh, there's a lot of questions that are in there that um, you can't really quantify the behavior with. A better example is if you come at this by saying the student demonstrates noncompliance by orienting his body away from the work area, physically looking away, changing topics of conversation. Um, maybe they're not engaged. Their attention issues or avoidance can, can be then broken down and looked at. Um, so you're really giving more of a description of what you want to see changed. And that's really important. So this assessment will help you answer questions like, why is the behavior occurring? What purpose does the behavior serve? And again, we want to look at this and say, um, let's not blame the victim of these behaviors. There's always a purpose behind the behavior. So what is going on? Um, the children typically won't, you know, uh, you know when, when you look at it and say, I don't know why he doesn't want to learn. Children aren't doing this typically uh, just to hurt you. This is, this is really, uh, we have to identify that and, and pull ourselves out of that and say, why is this behavior occurring? And what can we do to help change it? So a student with brain injury, there's a couple things here just to take away um, that might be affecting uh, a student who has had a brain injury. Um, some students don't always learn from their peers. Um, to put Johnny, who's had a brain injury, together with Jane and Bobby uh, and hope that by osmosis or whatever uh, transference method you're using, that all of a sudden Bobby is going to learn how to, or Johnny is going to learn how to, uh, to do whatever, whatever the key kids in the class do well, is probably unrealistic. It's really not telling us, you know, it's not getting to the root of that behavior, and it probably won't transfer into other, you know, other situations. Um, a student with brain injury might not learn from social situations uh, because they do have, struggle with maybe their own uh, uh, understanding or perception of, of the situation. Uh, a student, again, might behave like a much younger child. Depending on when they were injured and what stage of development they were injured in, 
uh, you might see someone who uh, shows immaturity, and, and we blame that and say, why aren't you acting like a 15-year-old? Well, you were injured when you were 10. That's sometimes sometimes we'll see more of the 10-year-old com coming out and through. And, and again, testing those boundaries as to learning. That's how, that's how people learn after brain injury is, is to test those boundaries and understand what's appropriate, what's not. And uh, you know, having a consistent response to all of those are very important. You might want to make sure that the, the noisy surroundings are, dis, um, are uh, lessened, if possible. Um, it's very easy for someone to become distracted. If there's some hypersensitivity to touch, you want to make sure you understand that also before uh, you, know, you go around and, and, and maybe start doing that, because that, that does happen after brain injury. Uh, you might have children who uh, demonstrate poor feeding uh, or grooming care. Uh, so you might have some appearance issues where you're thinking, wow, well, you know, what's going on uh, with that child at home? And, and it's literally sometimes just that, that self-recognition that, um, or initiation problem of, of beginning to groom and care for themselves. And you might have children who are easily influenced by others, and that, of course, is a worry from us. Uh, you know, if there's vulnerable uh, children out there um, that are made more vulnerable because of those cognitive uh, effects. And so we want to make sure that that is not... Um, you know, that, that, that they are as, uh, in, as less, less influenced by negative things as possible. So uh, going right into what, how we can help you, uh, Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa has been around for about 35 years or so, almost 40 now, I would guess. I, my math is poor right now. But, um, <clears throat> and recently, we've instilled, since 2007, uh, a, a new program entitled Neural Resource Facilitation. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second here, but I want to also point out that the Brain Injury Alliance has numerous other services. Um, we have partners around the state of Iowa called our Iowa Brain Injury Resource Network sites that help us uh, disseminate information uh, to others and education to others about brain injury. We have support groups around the state. We have peer mentoring programs. Uh, we have legislative self-advocacy uh, that we assist people with. In fact, we just had our uh, annual Hill Day, or day at the state capitol, and we had a wonderful turnout. Uh, a lot of folks recognized brain injury because we were there in force. Uh, we have education, so we do trainings, case consultations for people. Uh, we have an annual conference coming up here in March. So there's a lot of di different things that the Brain Injury Alliance can do to help. But we also have the Neural Research Facilitation Program. And why this came about was, Back in 1998, pardon me, there was a needs assessment that was just, uh, given out across the state, implemented across the state, and it was to find out what is it in the state of Iowa that we need? Um, what are people struggling with after brain injury? And people pointed to the fact that there is um, a lot of things that are unknown. Um, if you look here, you can see people are flooded with different information after brain injury. There's um, questions about assessments and evaluations. There's questions about the different types of needs that people have, emotional support, financial assistance, legal advice, substance abuse treatment, vocational services, et cetera. Where do you go to get all of these, all of this information? Well, you can go to the specific individual organizations, and you're going to get specific individual answers. Um, but then we realize we need some place that houses all of that information together to help that holistic approach to the person recover. And neural resource facilitation was born out of that. Where do people go to get their information? Well, you can see there's a plethora of places that people will go. They might go to the Social Security office. Uh, uh, they might go to um, uh, Voc Rehab. They might go to the Department of Human Services. There's a lot of different places where you can receive information. But again, um, all that information does is give you piece-by-piece -piece information. Where do people help get help interpreting that information? Um, how do you navigate that information once you have it? How do you implement it? Um, some people with brain injuries do have uh, memory issues or initiation issues, and it's very difficult for them to get that type of, in that type of information. So we all um, want to make sure that that information is, uh, is determined as important for that person, um, that their needs are being met, and that they are be being able to become as independent as possible after brain injury. So resource facilitation is a partnership that helps individuals and communities choose, get, and keep information and services to make informed choices and meet their goals. Um, we've been uh, kind of referred to as in the middle of uh, information resources for people and case management. We don't do as much as case management uh, in terms of holding the purse strings of the services. We help you link to those services. We help make sure that um, those services are, are appropriate, that there are things that you need, that they are um, kept uh, at a reasonable rate. 
Um, and, and sometimes we, we give some information resources. Sometimes we'll give you the, the information that you're looking for and follow up with you. Um, the nice thing about resource facilitation is we don't leave people hanging in the cracks. Um, we follow up with folks up to two years on different increments, uh, three, six, nine months, 12 months, 18 months, just checking in to make sure that they uh, have gotten that information, that it was useful, that they're not being uh, stranded, left out there stranded. And uh, it's very important that people understand that you know sometimes, sometimes uh, uh, because brain injury is still being learned about, is still trying, struggling to get their own services and supports, is still being recognized as the disability that it is, that uh, some people will, might need extra assistance, and that's what neural resource facilitation provides. How does it work? Well, we um, help you uh, assess and plan. If you give us a call or, or come in or, or whatnot, we help you assess and plan your needs. We identify and prioritize your uh, goals. We negotiate because sometimes uh, you know you might have lofty goals that are just not able to be met, especially in this climate of services uh, and and uh, and budget. Uh, we mo help monitor and, and reassess you when appropriate, and we do some outreach and education and training. The principles are very simple but very important. Uh, research facilitation is individualized. Um, each person that works with us is not treated in, in a group clumped manner. We individualize every single person. We make sure that their uh, strengths are being highlighted, that their needs are being met. Uh, facilitation is accessible, holistic, effective, uh, and valued that it's the participant that's driving this, that it's creative and flexible, which is nice because uh, we, we are able to, to do that uh, in a great manner, and that it builds community partnerships. So co some common things that we've seen uh, come out of neuro research facilitation, especially for kiddos. Um, we've seen some kiddos who have been labeled with um, something called DD, developmental disabilities, or ID, intellectual disabilities after their brain injury, that we want to caution people with. Just because a child may have um, been tired the day of the IQ testing that labeled them as ID or DD, um, you know, that does not necessarily mean that putting ID interventions in place are going to work. So we want to make sure that we assist the providers and the schools and the families with building a plan that's um, more catered towards that brain injury and the type of brain injury they've, they've had, um, rather than lumping into a group that maybe is not appropriate. Um, Children with uh, brain injuries are often misunderstood. Uh, we assist with IEP meetings or individual education plan meetings, and uh, we do uh, assume that uh, you know that people might want our uh, information. Uh, an IEP does not sometimes always identify brain injury factors, so we want to highlight those and make sure that they're called upon. Testing is sometimes not incorporated uh, with uh, with brain injury, so we want to make sure that the testing that they're receiving is timely and appropriate. Um, some children will receive neuropsychological testing um, that really helps us understand the, the, the um, strengths and the deficits uh, from brain injury and, and work on those strengths. Um, you know, again, the type of learning that's uh, incorporated, et cetera. And consistency is not always followed between school and home, so that's really important for us to, to explain that consistency is key. Where do we turn? Well, as a neuro, neuro research facilitator, we do utilize um, a lot of different places. However, a few of them that I'd like to call upon are the area education agency teams. Some of them have brain injury support teams. We work with school psychologists, therapists, and contracted specialists. The Center for Disabilities and Development in Iowa City is a wonderful partner um, where we um, are able to uh, utilize their behavioral approaches and, and work with uh, the, the uh, schools and the, and the families on that. We utilize legal resources, such as uh, ASK resources, Disability Rights Iowa, and different legal resources to make sure that that child, child's legal uh, rights are being secured. And we also work with neuropsychologists. We work with uh, child de developmental specialists and different community partners. So it's, it's very uh, nice to, to see uh, all the different people that are, are working with us. And, and connecting to us is very simple. We have toll-free numbers. We've got local calls that come in. We've got links from our websites or direct emails. We've got connections at presentations or meetings. Uh, people sometimes will walk in, and there's a registry that actually goes out that I can talk about a little bit more, but I'm going to actually wrap this up. And, and in the end, uh, I'm going to give a quote to you from the Dalai Lama that I just found that says, do not let the behavior of others destroy your inner peace. And I think it's very important to understand that by becoming aware and continually striving to learn more, 
you are an asset to the people that you're serving, to the people that you're working with after brain injury. Just do the best with what you have, and that's the most important lesson. So I'm going to turn this over to Jeff now, who's going to follow up on uh, the rest of the presentation here. And uh, Megan, I'm wondering if you can turn it over with Jeff. And thank you very much for listening. And I'm just checking to see. Can you hear me? Anybody? I can hear you. Good. Well, that's probably that's a, that's a good sign. I'm not talking <laughs> to myself. Jeff. Good, thank you. Jeffrey Lauer here, uh, Executive Director of the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa. First of all, thank you all for attending. I'm guessing that some of you are educators, and for those of you who are educators, um, thank you so much for taking time to look and see a little bit more about brain injury. Um, I have no doubt that your days are very full and trying to accommodate more information and more techniques to deal with kids um, who are not neurotypical uh, is tough stuff. It's tough, tough, it's tough stuff to do. The variability around brain injury is tough, and the research uh, regarding pediatric acquired brain injury, um, which includes traumatic brain injury, is not as good as it should be. One of the pieces I wanted to share towards the end of this um, presentation is some hope in that area. Uh, first of all, research about pediatric acquired brain injury, PABI, is lagging tremendously. We know that um, autism, which needs support, is uh, getting federal support around a billion dollars a year. HIV AIDS, which has been and still is an issue, uh, has gotten a lot of attention. And pediatric brain injury, which is the leading cause of death and disability for children and young adults, is lagging tremendously behind for research. It's, it's significantly less than 10 million annually. And we have nobody to blame uh, but ourselves, those of us who are advocates. We haven't done a great job yet advocating. However, there have been, over the last three years, um, a significant uptick in the advocacy around pediatric acquired brain injury. And there has been introduced into Congress uh, last year and being reintroduced this year. Go ahead and advance the slide, Tosh. Um, legislation that would and hopefully will expand the capacity of you and others who deal with kids with brain injury. A seven-year initiative to deploy the National um, Pediatric Acquired Brain Injury Plan, the PAVI plan, currently slated at $2.9 billion, which seems pretty amazing number to talk about You know, during a week when we're talking about sequestration cutbacks the federal deficit, but it's not that much when we talk about what are the current public health epidemics as recognized. We in the brain injury advocacy business have been sadly, um, we have sadly benefited tremendously from an increasing awareness of um, brain injury in sports, both professional sports such as the NFL, but also in our youth sports. Uh, youth sports and concussion is on the radar screen in a big way in most states, including Iowa. In fact, just this last week at the state capitol, we had legislators meeting with the Iowa um, High School Athletic Association and the Board of Educational Examiners to ask them whether it was going to be necessary to pass legislation to require Iowa coaches to, to, ha to show and demonstrate training in concussion and the signs, symptoms, and behaviors of brain injury so that they can better protect and monitor youth athletes. And the Board of Educational Examiners is now working with the Iowa High School Athletic Association, the Iowa Girls High School Athletic Association, to require over the next uh, 12 and 24 months coaches to have uh, documented training for, um, around brain injury. So we're, we're, make, we're moving in that direction. And, and then the outcome from that, and also from the outcome from understanding that over the last decade, that brain injury was the signature injury of our war fighting efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, those components have really increased the awareness. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the president mentioned um, brain injury and traumatic brain injury in a number of his national um, presentations over the last couple of months. So this is a big deal. At the same time, we are reauthorizing legislation that has been in place for over a, uh, let's see, for since 2006. I was going to say over a decade, but it hasn't been since, two, uh, now 1996. It has been over a decade. In 1996, I'm like Tasha at this time of day. Math is not my strong suit. In 1996, President Clinton 
deployed and signed the Traumatic Brain Injury Act, which has given states uh, kind of a bare bones amount of funding to increase the capacity of state systems to respond to brain injury. And this webinar, in fact, is being funded in part from money that's come out of the Congressional Traumatic Brain Injury Act. The PABI plan is looking to collaborate with the reauthorization of the TBI Act and increase the support for pediatric specific research, treatment, and, uh, and response. It, it has broad-based bipartisan support. It's got um, ultra Tea Party conservatives who are behind this. Um, it also has a plan that it wouldn't last forever. It would uh, spin up intensely, deploy a great deal of research, fund states, including Iowa, uh, at the tune of uh, Iowa would be, I think, receiving about $40 million over 10 years to increase capacity around Pete's brain injury. And that would be at the educational level, that would be at the medical level, it would be at the long-term support level, um, and at the AEA level. So again, this is, this is not money that's been deployed yet, but it typically in the advocacy world, it takes about three years to get a new concept through either the state house or the federal government. So we're encouraged that there is considerably more recognition in DC uh, around brain injury, and it does not seem to be one of the areas that is being subject to cutbacks at this time. Um, so I just wanted to leave that out there as a hopeful um, uh, excl exclamation point to our presentation. Uh, we are in March welcoming the president of the Pediatric Acquired Brain Injury Plan, as well as the founder of that effort, to, uh, to our, sp our spring conference. They're going to be um, holding a steering committee meeting around the Iowa PAPI plan. Um, on Friday, March 8th, and if any of you are interested in that, um, please email um, either uh, Megan or Tasha or myself. You can reach us at info, I-N-F-O, info at B-I-A-I-A dot org. Um, actually, that'll be on the last slide as well. And Tasha, can you advance that to the next slide? And then this is one, this is a quote from actually the president, uh, current president of that effort who reminds us that looking at brain injury is different than a disability. It's a developmental disability, not, not the same as a DD, but it's a developing disability in children. Because when it hits, um, it sets kids up for, in addition to that variability of, um, of challenges, challenges at each developmental stage, both cognitively, um, neurodevelopmentally, socially, uh, there, are, there are these uh, progressive challenges, and we in the, the Brain Injury Alliance, when we get calls from parents, you know, we have a lot of folks who call at the beginning of the school year and say, oh, it took me the whole last year in third grade to get, to get that system dialed in, and now I have to start again, and yes, parents get fatigued, but so do teachers. So thank you, those of you who are educators and, and others who support them. And one other piece, uh, Tasha referred to a flip book earlier in, uh, in this presentation. The Department of Public Health, if I'm not mistaken, uh, has, a, has produced and is going to be sharing in PDF format uh, later this week um, a, a flip book for educators. Now, what is a flip book? I hadn't really seen these. Um, this is a format. It's kind of a, a, a small cheat book where you have uh, indexes down both sides, and you can go specifically to um, tips and tricks for behavior or definitions or symptoms a variety of components around brain injury. So I'm sure that those of you who are registered for this will be getting an email when that's available. The last slide, Tosh. Thank you. And that's really a very much of a thank you. If you have um, any interest in uh, additional information on the Pediatric Acquired Brain Injury um, Steering Committee meeting in Des Moines on March 8th or our educational um, efforts from the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa, you can uh, check out our website at biaia.org. Um, we are reachable by email at info at biaia.org, and then we also have a toll-free number, 855-444-6443. Um, and I guess we should turn back to Megan and see if there have been any questions that have come through. There haven't been any, any questions that have come through. I'd like to thank both of you for presenting today. Um, we will be having one more webinar in this series. Uh, that webinar will be next Wednesday, 
On the 27th, Nova Adams will be presenting again on the end of her webinar that she did not get to finish, so she'll be talking specifically about strategies to use in the classroom. So I will be sending out information on that later this evening. So I would encourage you all to join us. But I thank you all for being on today and for your continued um, interest in this webinar series. Thanks, and have a great evening.